for July the 9th is entitled Living a Holy Life. The key verse is Romans 6, verse 22, which says, But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. The scripture is from Mark 12, verses 28 through 34, Romans 6, verses 19 through 22, and 1 John 3, verses 4 through 10. The lesson focus, living a holy life requires making changes with God's help. In the overview it says that the Bible often refers to followers of Jesus Christ as saints, which means holy ones, yet we know that human beings are born sinful. How can we ever hope to be holy in the ways God is holy? And just how holy can we be? The Bible affirms that, because of God's grace, human beings have greater potential for godliness than they often realize. It is possible to live a holy life with God's enabling power. To do so requires some changes on our part, which the Holy Spirit enables us to make. To be holy, we must experience a change of attitude, allegiance, and action, which are made possible through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the Introduction it says that Hebrew words meaning holy, holiness, or sanctify appear more than 800 times in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, Greek words having parallel meanings appear nearly 300 times. While many of these terms are applied to God, many are used to describe ordinary people like us. Clearly, holiness is a great concern to God. In today's lesson, we will begin to see what it means for a human being to be sanctified and understand what changes must be made in our lives if we are to be holy as God is holy. In part one, it says living a holy life requires a change in attitude. And the text is from Mark 12 verses 28 through 34, which says, One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, and with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. Maple syrup producers say that once sap is collected from maple trees, it can be boiled, becoming syrup. Further boiling reduces it to maple sugar. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could boil the essence of Christianity down to its simplest form? Jesus described the essence of Christianity in one idea, which is incorporated in two statements. The most important commandment is this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. The Old Testament reduced the essence of our relationship with God to Ten Commandments. Jesus further reduced it to two statements about loving God and others. In the end, it all boils down to love. In his classic work, A Plain Account of Christian Perfection, John Wesley recommended a balanced approach to Christian living, stating, It is nothing higher and nothing lower than this, the pure love of God and man, the loving God with all our heart and soul and our neighbor as ourselves. It is love governing the heart and life, running through all our tempers, words, and actions. The problem, however, is that we do not naturally love God or others. We love ourselves. We are self-centered and selfish. 
So in its most basic form, a life of holiness consists of replacing self-centeredness with love for God and others. Understanding that we must love God and others places us not far from the kingdom of God. On the other hand, to internalize that understanding to the point that we truly love God and others more than we love ourselves is foreign to our normal way of thinking. It requires a change of attitude. That change is not as simple as turning over a new leaf. We really can't make such a profound change on our own. It comes when we begin a new life in Christ. This is why Paul said that a person who comes to know Jesus Christ is a new creation. The old is gone, the new is here. Peter urged, have sincere love for each other, and love one another deeply, from the heart. For this to occur, one must be born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. In part two, it says that living a holy life requires a change in allegiance, and the text is from Romans 6, verses 19 through 22, which says, I am using an example from everyday life because of your human limitations, just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things that you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. A change in one's attitude must be accompanied by a change of allegiance. All of us are slaves to something. We are either slaves to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness, or slaves to righteousness leading to holiness. Being enslaved to one thing means being free from its opposite. The person who is a slave to sin is free from the control of righteousness. Likewise, the one who is a slave to righteousness has been set free from sin. In either case, there is a corresponding consequence. The person enslaved by sin finds that those things result in death. The person enslaved to God will reap a benefit that leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. Surely no one would choose to be a slave, yet Paul reminded his immediate readers, who were once enslaved by sin, you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity. This implies that they did it voluntarily. Now Paul called on such persons to offer themselves as slaves to righteousness. There is a choice involved, according to Paul. Becoming a slave to righteousness requires an act of the will. In Old Testament times, a slave who had been released from servitude could choose to remain with his master voluntarily. If he did so, the master would take the former slave before the courts and pierce his ear with an awl. The servant would then become his slave for life. In the same way, we have the opportunity to choose our own master. We can choose to remain enslaved to sin for life, or we can become slaves of God, which leads to holiness. Right thinking and correct loyalties lead to appropriate behavior. In part three, it says living a holy life requires a change in actions and the text is from 1 John 3, verses 4 through 10, which says, Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin, because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are, and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, 
nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. Once we have experienced a change in attitude and allegiance, we must be prepared to change our actions. John spelled out the connection between allegiance and actions in his writing, saying that a person who does what is right is righteous, and a person who does what is sinful is of the devil. If a person continues to sin after professing to know Christ, and a person has not seen him or known him, the logical conclusion is that no one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. This teaching presents a practical problem because nearly every follower of Jesus falls in some way after receiving Christ as Savior. Does this mean that anyone who commits a sin is of the devil and cannot possibly know God? That is not the case. In other writings, John made it clear that it is possible for a child of God to sin. He wrote, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. The real issue, according to John, is a person's underlying attitude and allegiance, which produce the habit of sinful behavior. John used phrases like, keeps on sinning, continues to sin, and go on sinning, to describe this. The phrasing implies that for a true believer, sin will not continue to be a way of life. Though he or she may fail occasionally, sin will not be the norm. A distinct change in his or her actions will be seen. Furthermore, acts that some people may label as sins really are not. John Wesley made the distinction between sin properly called so and what we might call mistakes or shortcomings. Wesley labeled sin as a voluntary transgression of a known law. He further described involuntary transgressions of God's law, acts done without the intention to offend God or others, which are not properly labeled sins. We make these distinctions not to encourage careless behavior, but to release people from feelings of condemnation for unintentional mistakes or blunders. Any wrongdoing, intended or not, should be confessed once it is brought to our attention. At the same time, we can be sure that we are walking in fellowship with God even though we may occasionally make mistakes. In today's life application, it says, How would you rate your attitude about holy living? Are you completely a self-centered person? Do you sometimes think about wanting to be less self-centered? Do you occasionally deny yourself putting God and others first? Do you put God and others first most of the time? Do you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself? How would you rate your allegiance to God Taking a personal inventory is one way to keep focused on a holy life.